Greetings ladies and metal gents and welcome to this patch video for MUD's mission taken from the website Royal Road. As always I hope that you all enjoy this episode and if you do please consider supporting the channel. Also all of these episodes will be available as a podcast on the various different podcast platforms. All the links will be down below. Chapter 85 Munitions Malfunction I will now expand on some general advice in regard to the sewer system of a dungeon town. Sanitation is vital importance to an ongoing health and safety of a large settlement. No one wants to live in a town with rivers of filth flowing down the streets. Experts in Earth Manor can make quick work of the task, creating reinforced tunnels below the city to divert waste. If no, Earth Mages or Mages with other relevant ideals are currently available, the task can be completed with manual labor. Considering the extreme difficulty of constructing sewers manually, it is almost always cheaper to pay for an Earth Mage to be transported to your location. Ideally, an Earth Mage should have been amongst the initial group to secure the newly located dungeon entrance. One unique risk which sewers in dungeon towns must take into consideration is, of course, the dungeon itself. While the higher floors of the dungeon are usually relatively stable, there are cases in which higher floors will move, expand, or shift considerably. If a dungeon cave should come into intersect with a section of sewer, the results can be disastrous. Imagine the panic when monsters start crawling out of the toilets. As such, it is advised only to use shallowly buried pipes too small for any dangerous monsters to fit through within the expected activity radius of the dungeon along with a reasonable buffer zone. If cost is not an issue, consider removing sewage entirely from the area around the dungeon using magical alternatives, such as water stones and nothingness pits. Outside of the area directly surrounding the dungeon, large and wide subterranean sewers are recommended. Spacious tunnels will make future repairs and management much simpler. As an added bonus, large sewers can double as backup shelters during waves or other natural or unnatural disasters. Making the tunnels larger than necessary also helps avoid the risk of overflow during heavy rains. Excerpt from Making a Labyrinth Town from Outpost to Metropolis The Demon, Vale Farazimalika Farius, known to his alias Vale Farwind, sat in a comfortable leather chair, looking down over the ongoing battle from the top floor of Calcaeus' city bank. In his hand, he slowly swished a crystal glass filled with the finest pankal wine, a specialty of the region. A look of dissatisfaction marred his statuesque face. This was not proving to be the disaster that he'd hoped for, so they found the mana sink and removed it. What a shame... The dodecahedral artifact had been difficult and expensive to craft, and had been likewise arduous to place without being detected. Unfortunately, it had been even more effective than planned. The city leadership had noticed the spike in monster production, and that troublesome leader had likely sniffed it out during the resulting sweep by using a unique skill. Malafar took a slow sip of his wine. Even in the secluded place, it was necessary for him to retain his human shape. It would be troublesome for someone below were to look through the glass while he showed his true form. There was also the matter of the soldier standing behind him. What do we do now, General? Should we call off the attack? An ant nearly as large as a horse stood upright and its hindmost legs in the stiff attention behind the demon's chair. The soldier wore a grey military jacket and peaked cap tailored to the creature's unique anatomy. Several well-polished medals adorned the jacket's left breast. Despite the chittering and clacking of the mandibles as it talked, the voice had a distinctly feminine tone. In truth, Valifar wasn't really concerned about the actual winning of this battle. A loss here would still cause the human suffering and demon craved. It would only be the nation that he had infiltrated suffering instead of the nation of Panko. Of course, he could not admit such openly. No, Lieutenant, we will proceed as planned. It's unfortunate, but we've already invested too much in this operation. And besides, Velifar glanced out of the window towards the east. If it has already been found, then it's only a matter of time until the artifact is traced back to the Fagia Republic. They probably already handed it over to the Great Enchanter to examine. Understood, General. Shall I signal the confirmation? The ant's antenna twitched slightly. 
Valavar finished the remainder of his glass of wine. Delicious. Yes, send a message. We'll let them tire themselves out for a while first. We'll strike at noon. Understood, General. Sending confirmation now. Leanne settled into a fugue state and her antennae swayed wildly. Valavar settled into his seat to enjoy the show. Mud was very pleased with the efficient manner in which the humans start with the dungeon wave event. Despite the inherent danger of fighting a large number of monsters, there had yet been no fatalities. A few delvers and soldiers along the front lines had received injuries, but they were quickly rotated out and healed by nearby specialists. In one case, the city guardsman had acted carelessly and even had his head taken clean off by sharp mandibles of a glutton worm. The support group had acted with incredible speed, quickly retrieving the man's head and repairing the wound before even a second had passed. The guard was forced to leave the battlefield due to mental shock, but seemed to have no lingering physical effects. Next to Mud sat a male human mage in meditation, steadily releasing free mana for Mud to use. The pink-haired mage said that his ideal was love and was not suitable for combat, and so he was helping in the way instead. While crafting a free mana into ideal of home, Mud had sent a message to Jabrax. Jabrax can healing magic recover any damage. Jabrax relaxed on an invisible chair, leaning back dangerously. Yes, no, as long as the attack isn't fatal, a life form can be restored to their vision of self pretty easily. There are some medical problems that a magical solution hasn't been found for yet, though, like aging. Any injury so old that a person considers it a part of their identity also cannot be healed. Isn't a human's head being removed fatal? Only if they die. Jabrax continued with a short pause. Once a person's soul believes that they've taken enough damage that their vessel isn't alive anymore, the soul will leave the body and can no longer be restored. But if you act quickly enough, the soul won't have time to realize it should be dead and leave the body, no matter how bad the damage is. Cobb chimed in, leaning forward enthusiastically. I heard a story one time of a man being flattened under a falling chunk of masonry. His body was completely crushed into paste. Novus balked at the description as Cobb continued. Luckily, there was a powerful priest nearby. I think around tier six. He cast a healing spell in the flash, and the pile of blood and guts actually came back together. He was good as new, went on to live a normal life. That story sounds made up, but it's certainly possible, Jabrax nodded slightly. If I truly believed that I could not die, then I wouldn't be able to recover from any damage. Mud was already plotting how to brainwash itself. No, Jabrax immediately dashed those plans. It's all about how your soul sees its role within the false world through the twisted um. I mean, it has nothing to do with conscious thought. You would need to shape your soul into the shape that it has inherent quality of immortality. Are you saying that there are classes that can make you immortal? Cobb rubbed his chin. You wouldn't happen to know how to get the class like that, would you? It's uh, purely hypothetical, sorry, but you'll just have to grow old and die like the rest. Jabrax relaxed, posed, and grinned, made it clear that she was not sorry. Anyway, it would probably be easier to do it with species rather than class. For example, demons are immortal. Even if destroyed, they will reform in the abyss. I wish I were a demon. Cobb stared off into space while Jabrax nodded approvingly. The conversation was cut short by the pink-haired maid snapping back to wakefulness. Apologies, but I've run dry. I'll need to go and recover for a time. My replacement should be here shortly. After standing up, he made a slight bow towards the party, and then departed through the back of the pull box. Shortly after, a new mage entered, a woman with a shaved head. She refused to reveal what her ideal was and simply sat and released the free manor. As such, Mud continued casting Kill Pest for several hours. During this time, he gained several more levels, eventually reaching a level 11 Master Butler. Unfortunately, the increasing levels had reduced the experience income further. Now, even Corpse Worms had zero experience. As a combined level of 21, Mud was now technically a Tier 3. At noon, something changed. Multiple simultaneous explosions erupted from behind Mud. Vale Farwin sipped his wine on the rooftops and the wooden platform below were utterly obliterated by the maelstrom of magic artillery spells detonating. 
Normally, they were completely safe to store out in the open or handle roughly. Only by inserting into the barrel of the cannons could the enchantments be activated, allowing them to detonate after being launched. Fagan Ingenuity had bypassed such safety cards. By simulating the interior of the cannons over a wide area using a single-use enchantment, all other projectiles had been primed. The second tool had triggered them to explode. If Galtheus were fighting a human nation, these precautions against such methods would have certainly been taken. But against nearly mindless insects, it would have been a pointless waste of resources. The magic required for this act to sabotage was far too complex for even a particularly clever worm of the tower. But Gotheus was not merely fighting a wave anymore. As the chaotic energies faded, all that remained of the artillery installations was melted slag and piles of rubble. Below, the soldiers were in chaos. Like cockroaches escaping from the light, the humans scattered in all directions. The carefully established order of the battlefield was once again destroyed. With the removal of vital supporting artillery and the chaos in the back lines, the equilibrium in the front line was broken. While the insects were far from intelligent, the higher tier ones had a certain animalistic cunning. They recognized the moment of weakness and grasped it. The churning mass of worms surged forward with renewed vigor, giant caterpillars literally throwing themselves onto soldiers' weapons. Within moments, the soldiers were overwhelmed, while the line collapsing. While the most powerful fighters were able to hold their own against the onslaught, such as the leader Ghoul and Prince Kane, the majority were pushed back, and for the first time that day, there were deaths on the front line. To his credit, leader Ghoul was able to restore some semblance of order, ordering back lines to give everything they had without regard for preserving resources. He was able to halt the advance, forming a new line in front of the pullboxes. The battle would be more difficult for them now, but his leadership and proper coordination, they would still persevere. Galtheus was a town with a rather cautious leadership, all things considered. Unlike some other dungeon towns, they had multiple contingencies and safety nets in place for dealing with waves. Under normal circumstances, it was extremely unlikely for even a single defending soldier to die during a wave. Such was the length of their precaution. Even if the line were to be completely broken, they could simply retreat and allow the town to be overrun, then take their time and slowly reclaim the city. It was far from ideal, but the civilian fallback locations were designated to be safe even when attacked by a worm at the tower, which was the most powerful creature the dungeon could produce. It would be economically disastrous, but not the end of the city. The people could always rebuild. No, of course, that's all assuming they were only fighting the dungeon. Wonderful! At least this part of the plan is a success! Behind him, the ant chittered in agreement. Send the signal to attack directly. Don't give them any more time to recover. Understood, General. The ant's antenna waved wildly. End of chapter. Chapter 86. Military of the Masses. Explosions raged out behind mud as the artillery was wrapped in a chaotic energy. Jobrax, is that how those devices function normally? No, mud. No, it is not. Jobrax hopped down from her perch in the air and ran her back on the bunker, followed shortly by Common Novus. Wow, it's beautiful, commented Ego from her position on Novus's side. Her scabbard had been mostly restored to its original state as a result of careful polishing on Mud's part. Although the leather still looked aged, Ego had said she liked the new look, saying it was refined. While Mud thought about the aesthetics of the equipment, the golem was distracted by the screaming and disordered scrambling of the humans in the wake of the explosions. An illogical reaction, thought Mud. Running around and screaming incoherently are both unlikely to improve one's current situation. Mud had much more respect for those that steadfastly continued to perform their tasks, despite the disruption. The elites on the front lines of combat were able to quickly re-establish order amongst their own ranks. Church personnel also showed remarkable stoicism in the face of the unexpected event. Those who reacted with the most poorly were the younger and less experienced amongst the Dalvers, who had no rigorous formal training. It's unthinkable that an accident would happen at all the replacements at the same time. 
Someone must have sabotaged them. Jabrax rubbed her chin as the magic study faded, revealing the ruined remains of the buildings and platforms upon which they had rested. Couldn't the great magician restore them like he did with the staircase? A hint of panic was clear in Novus's voice. Jabrax shook her head, but Cobb answered for her. What are you, a moron? If Mag fixed it, it could just blow up again. It is possible that this is something they could only do once, but it's not worth the gamble. Magnus is too important to waste energy needlessly when an unknown enemy has arrived. This might be a stupid question, but, um, Novus hesitated for a moment. There's no way that the dungeon did this, uh, right? I should think not. Within the sewers of Galthea stood an ant size of a horse, clad in an unadorned grey military uniform. It stood in a fugue state antenna, swaying wildly. Around him, tightly packed with wide tunnels, stood multiple of human soldiers, resting in preparation for the upcoming battle. Compared to most militaries, the Republic's uniforms were rather simple. Conscripts were expected to provide their own armor, resulting in wide variations in style amongst the troops. What unified the desperate soldiers was the tabard that each wore, the slate grey of the Republic, emblazoned on the breast with the symbol of Fagia and the shark black, the downward pointing triangle symbolizing the many beings above the few. This symbol represented the core ideal of the Fagia Republic, that the common people were the ones with power. There was no king or ultra-wealthy or ruling class in Fagia, all things were a matter of popular vote, and all property was owned by everyone. The powerful, those with high tiers who held the responsibility of command, were servants of the masses. Even the general in its very excursion, Bale Farwind, could be removed from command by a majority vote from his soldiers. Of course, they would never even think of doing such a thing. They were loyal to the general. He had gifted the troops with countless victories before, and today... He had no doubt that he would bring them yet another. Capturing the city would be a great boon to the people of Fagia. And should the citizens of Gartheus join the Republic willingly, it would be a boon to them too. While the soldiers performed the various activities, all eyes remained on the ant. After joining the Republic, the ant men had quickly integrated themselves into the nation. Due to the large population size, they enjoyed greater rights than most species. Their kind also displayed remarkable solidarity, forming a powerful voting bloc. In the military, their unique ability to perform long-distance, untraceable communication was also invaluable. Finally, the communications officer exited his fugue state. All conversations in the tunnel immediately stopped as the soldiers awaited the general's command. The distinctive clicking voice of the Ant-Man quickly filled the echoing tunnel. "'We are to move!' Commence the attack immediately. Artillery has been destroyed. A short cheer spread through the troops. They had all heard the reverberations of the blast moments ago, but this confirmation was very welcome. Wave is less than projected. Expect heavy resistance. The selected commander for detachment, a veteran of countless battle under General Farwind, quickly called the men to formation. Within moments, the disorganized mob was arrayed in straight lines, three abreast. Although the tunnels were wide, this was the most that they could fit on the paths without wading into flowing water. With another sharp command, the troops began their march. On the ocean coast of the city of Gothea sat several large boats, as well as the corpses of those few guardsmen left to watch the seas. Beside the corpses lay a thick, reinforced, and heavily enchanted bars which would normally block access to the sewers. Now they were little more than mangled and torn metal. Jabrax stood with a calculating look on her face for some time. Eventually she seemed to have an epiphany. Mud, we should return to the mansion. Now, are you suggesting we abandon our post? Novus was shocked at the idea. Why? Mud's response was more subdued. A foreign nation is taking advantage of the wave to attack the city. It's not even a rare tactic. I can't think of any other explanation of the explosions. Cobb scratched his head in an exaggerated confusion. Who would want to even attack Panko? They're not at war with anyone. Who cares? Jabrax crossed her arms and looked sternly. I don't want to get stuck in some war and die pointlessly. But it's our patriotic duty to our homeland of Panko. 
Nobis proclaimed proudly. Everyone just stared at her for a moment in silence. Under the glare, she was it, eventually letting out a weak, um, never mind. Right, so let's get out of here. We need to split before they attack again or our troops arrive. Jabrax punched her open palm into the paste back and forth in the small pillbox. Mud considered the options. A human had told it to come here and assist with holding back the dungeon wave. While it had never been directly ordered to remain until the end of the wave, it was implied as such. It was a matter of guessing at intent. But all things being equal, Mud would prefer to remove all doubt by remaining where it was. Seeing as Mud wasn't reacting, Jabrax tried a different tactic. Mud, if the enemy nation takes over Galtheus, they'll be coming to loot Sothlar's house next. We need to secure our defenses. That was enough to convince Mud. Unlike the ambiguous order to remain, the order to protect the estate was clear. We will return to Sithlar Estate. Great. I don't want to die in the war either. I'll come with you guys. Cobb quickly gathered his equipment and as much of the association provided gear as he could carry. Nova sighed the front lines of the battle. I don't know about this. Without hesitation, Mud once again blasted Novus with mind magic, eroding her ability to resist compulsions. Do as I command. Leave with me. Do not question my orders. Novus looked slightly dazed for a moment and said, Yes, I shouldn't question. You know what's best. After Mud released the spell, the light of rationality slowly returned to the girl's eyes. The golem was slightly concerned that she was taking longer than previously to regain her senses and a mild madness seemed to remain in her eyes even after the effects had fully faded. Mental degradation, in all likelihood. But that was a concern for another time, under less pressing circumstances. We're leaving now. With rapid steps, Mud made its way out of the pearl box, followed shortly by its minions. Quickly spotting the group, the association employee approached. Mr. Mud, you don't have to worry about the explosions. We have it under control. Return to your task and put it out of your mind. Cobb, before Mud could finish the sentence, the heavily scarred warrior replied, No, you don't need to follow that one. What? Cobb rudely pushed the employee to the side as the group walked briskly away from the front lines and in the direction of the road. By now, order had mostly been restored to the field. As such, a group of fighters moving away from the front lines stood out as strange. Before anyone could approach to question them again, however, a useful distraction appeared. Arcing over the rooftops west of the field came rain of arrows. While some few noticed the incoming projectiles, including mud itself, the warning cry came too late. Countless soldiers and dalvers were skewered with a wide spread of projectiles. Mud's group came out unscathed thanks to the golem's quick actions. Immediately sending the mental warning to of danger, mud stretched his body to create a dome of rock above his companions, deflecting the steel-hardened arrows. Dropping a majority of the stolen goods from the pillbox, Cobb began running east at full sprint. The rest of the group soon followed his example. Mud's party was not in the only group fleeing either. While Dowlers were very willing to participate in monster subjugation, they often had very little regard for nations. As it became clear that the matters of escalating beyond what they were comfortable with, those with weak loyalties began to flee. Quickly, Lost in the flow of bodies, Mud's group managed to escape the battlefield. As Mud rounded a corner onto the cobblestone road, it saw another body of arrows boarding towards the field behind it. Valafar examined the state of the battlefield from his position on top of the bank building. As expected, a large amount of Dalvas were fleeing. Fagia would need to pay reparations to the association for hitting their personnel during a sneak attack, but the Dalvas Association's laws regarding unintentional casualties during acts of war provided some leeway. Ironically, there would be fewer repercussions from the Association for killing 50 Dalvas during an act of war than killing a single Dalva in a time of peace. The Dalvas now scurried down the streets and away from the area of conflict and would likely flee entirely out of the city. Of course, Velafar would make no attempt to stop them. Why should he? There was no need to waste manpower on a pointless engagement. Besides, once the Republic established control over the city, those very same people would likely return to work for the dungeon. Dalvas are notoriously fickle. As the troops below finally began circling around the buildings to the west of their melee strike, only one thing truly concerned Valafar. 
Hopefully, his battle today wouldn't mess up whatever plans Jabrax was working on in the city. Inconveniencing a real life would be a truly regrettable. End of chapter. Chapter 87. Mud's Misanthropy. Number 5. Dragons. Research on the life cycle of draconic race faces unique difficulties. Dragons are secretive and have more than enough power and skill to enforce that secrecy. Regardless, I have made an effort to record what little is known and separate out the speculation and folklore. One bit of folk wisdom which I have determined to be false is the pervasive belief that dragons are born already at a tight tier. This is certainly not true. Kingdoms that have managed to capture and hatch dragon eggs have found them to be tier one, and as weak at birth as any other large animal. An incredibly powerful and average dragon can instead only be explained with their culture and instincts. When a clutch of dragon eggs first hatches, the newborn dragons will immediately throw themselves at their siblings, fighting until only one remains. This might also serve as an explanation as to the surprisingly low dragon population despite the well-documented fact that they breed annually and lay multiple eggs at a time. After the initial culling, it is known to the parent dragons will immediately begin training their child in hunting. Within a year of rapid killing, the typical dragon will already be tier 4. Such rapid growth may be shocking to a sapient, but it comes at a cost most would not be willing to pay. Even putting aside the death toll of the cullings, only a tiny fraction of wild dragons survive their first year of life. During this year, the training, the dragon will participate in a ritual of some kind which will grant them a strong affinity for a certain element, as well as a changing the color of the scales. While normal dragon society is secretive, the details of this dragon rite are perhaps the most carefully guarded of all. As a result, dragons raised in captivity have constantly been unable to achieve this transformation, remaining instead in inferior drakes. There are also known cases of wild dragons raised without parents, usually due to parents dying, that become drakes. Attempts to uncover details of this ritual are universally met with aggression from dragon society, so I strongly advise any reader not dig any deeper on the subject. Those fraction of dragons that survive their first year of life or complete the dragon rite are accepted as full members of dragon society. At this point, each individual dragon then separates from their parents to pursue whatever their personal interests might be. Some of the greatest artists, warriors, poets, and wielders of ideals have been dragons. The only unifying trait which seems to apply to all dragon kind is love of fine craftsmanship and powerful pride. I for one think that pride is well earned. Excerpt from Rupert's Encyclopedia of the 365 Magical Beasts The first major obstacle has Mud's group made their way to east of the formidable town walls of Gathaeus. Currently, the gates were lowered and firmly shut. A sensible choice, as Mud understood it, the walls were effectively a backup in case initial containment of the wave failed. At the same vein as evacuating the city was the defense of fortifications. Defenders could fall back to a fortified location throughout the city and take their time slowly wearing down the insects without concern of the monsters escaping into the surrounding countryside or harming the civilians. Having such beasts roaming unchecked would be considerably risky to trade and farming. The walls also served a dual purpose of keeping the town in safe from the outside danger year-round. Not that it had worked this time. Now, though, the wall served only as a hindrance for those that sought to flee the city. While mud could easily contort its body to fit through the metal portcullis, now that blocked the gate, the same could not be said for the remainder of the party. Mud's equipment, particularly its new metal endoskeleton, would likewise not fit through. Jabrax, fly the humans over the wall, I'll climb. Pushing the body tight against the wall, Mud carefully formed his body fit any crack and imperfections in the wall, pulling itself upward with a smooth face. The demon scooped up Novus in her arms, extracting a surprised yelp from the shorter girl. That's fine, but you won't make much progress trying to climb. What do you... Uh... Mud was unable to finish that sentence and was suddenly pushed back from the wall by a small force. While the power behind the push was tiny... It was enough to separate its body entirely from the stone structure. Having lost its grip, Mud frantically grasped towards the wall in an attempt to regain its hole. 
but to no avail. The column soon spattered on to the cobblestone streets below. Laying on the cold stone and looking up at the skies, Mud considered its options. Meanwhile, Cobb doubled over in laughter. Instead of flying as she usually did, Jibraxon said seemed to leap from one invisible platform as she climbed into the air. After a dozen such hops, she crested the wall and disappeared from sight. Moments later, she returned sans nervous. Your turn, ugly. Jibrax advanced towards Cobb. Don't mind if I do. With a lewd grin on his face, Cobb walked towards the demon with his arms spread wide. His attempt to hug only caught air. However, as Jibrax elegantly ducked under his arms and grabbed the man by the back of his shorts. Before he could protest, she again leapt into the air. Mud righted itself and completed its plan. First, Mud quickly climbed to the top of a nearby building, reaching the approximately half the height of the wall. Next, Mud applied a skate to its body and equipped to reduce air friction of its body with as much possible. Finally, Mud charged a powerful false bolt, angling it to the steep upwards at an angle. Mud fired the spell into the internal sphere of metal with a full 70 points of mana. This was by far the strongest force bolt the golem had ever attempted. The result was, um, perhaps greater than Mud had calculated. Mud easily cleared the wall and continued to arc higher into the air above the forest. At the highest point of the arc, Mud could see the entirety of the city of Gothias and the master's mansion spread out below it. After a moment of weightlessness, Mud began to accelerate towards the ground. Mud focused on keeping its body together when it struck the ground. An explosion of wood and dirt flew through the forest as muddy cannonballs struck the forest floor. Not long after, the remainder of Mud's group arrived at the landing site. Mud, are you okay? A worried novice rushed over to the small crater and lifted Mud up. Slithering out of the girl's hands, Mud replied, Yes, I'm fine. Please stay away for a moment. Dutifully taking a step back, Mud made its way a bit distance between the two. After a few seconds of preparation, Mud smashed into the ground with incredible force, causing another explosion. Nova screamed, and she cowered behind her shield, dirt and wood raining down around her. What in the abyss was that about, Mud? The girl screamed angrily at the golem. I had to fix a dent. The operation was a success. Returning to its feet without any sign of harm, Mud began to walk steadily east. Follow me, we must secure the mansion. Taking the whole ordeal in stride, Cobb and Jabrax followed after the construct. After taking a moment to look at the two new craters on the forest floor, Novus followed them. Boss, I understand this place is like your base or whatever, but I think we should leave this area entirely. Let's just grab the valuables from the place and split. Come back when this blows over. Mud immediately rejected Cobb's suggestion. Leaving is not an option. I must protect Master's home. Look, Sith lost dead, isn't he? That's why you're running wild, right? So who cares which his stuff gets wrecked? What? Sith Lord is dead? Everyone ignored the surprised yell of Novus. I care if his stuff gets wrecked. We must remain here and defend it. Finally, the mansion in question came into view as Mud proceeded immediately towards the door and unlocked the entrance. Jabrax had a conflicted look on her face. Eventually, she seemed to make a decision. Actually, it might be possible to do both, flee and protect the mansion from the invasion force. As soon as they entered, Cobb sat heavily on the nearby chair. Hey, this is the way we fought at one time, right? I probably could have killed you back then and looted all the stuff if I didn't get cold feet. What a missed opportunity. Novus began carefully examining the many rare books on display on the bookshelf. Both of you are not to damage or destroy any of the master's possessions. The punishment for failure is death. Novus quickly pulled back a hand that was reaching for a book. I will provide you with a list of items which may be utilized to perpetrate your metabolic and processes soon. Mud then turned to focus towards Jabrax. What is your suggestion? Well, I told you before that I don't really know what the drive works, but I have a guess combined with those motors... Cobb interrupted her explanation. Can this building move or something? Jibrax sneered towards the scarred man. It is really annoying how quickly you figure things out. You know that, right? Yeah. Anyway, I never looked into it because then I would have to tell you if I confirmed it to be true. Now, though, I think it's my own best interest if we can get out of here. 
If we simply leave now, won't we face repercussions for leaving with Ego? We have not completed the tournament, and leaving with this early wave will likely lower our contribution. Jirak scowled. Yeah, it's an unfortunate waste of our efforts until now. Things have accelerated beyond our expectations. We already have a church after you anyway. Throwing the kingdom on top of that shouldn't be too bad. I think I'm beginning to understand humans better. It was a mistake of ever attempting to integrate with their society. The first humans I ever encountered tried to steal from the master and destroy me. When I first encountered a human organization, they would destroy me for being a golem had I not deceived them. When I entered the human settlement for the first time, a human attempted to extort me with an implied threat of violence for trivial gain. When I attempted to follow the human's rules and cooperate to protect the master's possessions by joining their, uh, Delvers Association, I was heavily damaged and nearly died three times. Each time, I gained no benefit from nearly dying. And the only benefit I have gained from dealing with humans is access to the dungeon, their markets, and the class-changing artifact. However, that is truly not a benefit of cooperating with humans, for humans were the ones limiting access to those things in the first place. A powerful human organization now seeks my destruction, despite the fact that I have performed no action that conflicts with their interests, and I have expressed no desire to perform such an action. I have been forced to direct a large amount of my time and effort since I was created to defending myself from unreasonable aggression from sapiens. Jubrax made a jagged tooth smile. She seemed to like where this was going. And your conclusion, what do you think of these cattle of Archon? Sapiens should not be treated as rational agents or dealt with under the assumption of mutual cooperation. I understand now that it was my mistake to assume that they would act in a manner that would make it logical for others to interact with them peaceably. Sapiens are unreasonable and unpredictable, and cannot be trusted to have any chance to betray me. Sapiens are to be used as tools, only, controlled when possible, and either avoided or destroyed if they cannot be controlled. I should assume all human organizations are enemies, unless proven otherwise. And what about those two? Jabrax indicated to the two humans now resting nearby. While both feigned interest in the surroundings, it was very clear that they were focused on the half of the conversation they could hear. They are useful, and I can control them. I will retain them for the time being as tools. Good. You shouldn't go too far with your distrust and waste of useful resources. For all their flaws, Sabians still make useful things. I'll go down to the drive room and see if I can puzzle out some sort of controls. I don't know how long it'll take, however. That is acceptable. I will prepare the defenses. End of chapter. Chapter 88. Mirrored Monsters As the arrows fell, pieces came together in Thuggy Ghoul's head. The dodecahedral artifact was not just some experimental Sith laws, as he had expected. It was even possible that the idea of the tournament was planted by a foreign agent, whispered into the king's ear, serving the dual purpose of making a wave even more dangerous as well as drawing out the prince. It fit too well for mere coincidence. Such considerations were pointless now, however. Hindsight made everything clear, but the fact remained that he had failed to spot the warning signs until it was too late. Long-lasting peace with the kingdom of Pankal had reduced his wariness of human threats. Perhaps he had been further blinded by the recent disturbances, such as the disappearance of Bark Goldtooth and the appearance of the Construct. Still, there was no excuse for a failure of vigilance. Pull back! Retreat to the fortifications! Soldiers and doubles alike reacted immediately to his roared order, slowly falling back from the front lines. As Ghoul considered the fastest method to disengage, the question was answered for him by Magnus. The great magician swung his arms in a complex pattern, his left arm a perfect mirror of the right, all the time muttering under his breath. With a forward surge of his arms, the great horde of green forms appeared behind him on the front lines, a mirror reflection of the dungeon wave. While well, the reproduction was not perfect, and the creatures were smoothed out by simplified in places, their physicality was very much retained. And an instant later, the doppelgangers drove forward, weaving around the human soldiers to engage in tumbling meaty with the original souls. Magnus himself leaned forward and clutched his knees, breathing heavily. Full retreat to the east. 
free for the moment the soldiers turned and sprinted east, far away from the hail of arrows. As for Gul himself, he remained in the field. Beside him stood those few who had clout and disregarded a direct order from the association leader. The guard captain, the high priest, the prince, and the prince's three followers were all that remained on the wide grass field after the hasty retreat. Cain, you should leave. You're too valuable to be here. Go home and call for reinforcements. Gaul spoke to the side, not taking his gaze from the west. Prince Cain shook his head. I'm afraid I can't do that. If I am to lead this country one day, how am I to simply abandon my own people to save myself? The prince chuckled lightly. You know, as horrible as it sounds, I'm almost relieved to think that this was all the doing of a foreign nation. I'd actually begun to believe that my father had set this town up for disaster just to give me a chance to save it. That's, um, still a possibility. Magnus started up to the group. Maybe your father knew about the invasion plan, hmm? The beautiful female guard, Captain Algar, replied cynically. You only hope that's the case, since he wouldn't send his son to fight if he had no chance of winning. That would mean that we're not all about to die. All? Oh, I was just about to leave. I can get the message to the capital faster than anyone else here. As much as I'd hate to leave, it seems I used up too much of my mana with that last spell. I even had to eat up most of the external mana here. You didn't do that on purpose, so you had an excuse to run away. Algar squinted towards the old man. The great magician laughed. Well, maybe I did and maybe I didn't. Anyway, my duties to the crown do not include participating in war, and I should think the same should be true for you, Mr. Ghoul. The old man poked the leader in the ribs with a bony finger. It hurt, despite the heavy black armor the leader was wearing. I admit I don't care much for the kingdom of Pankal, but I am loyal to Galtheus. This is my home. I will not let it be despoiled by anyone. That's fair, Magnus turned towards the prince. Last chance to come with me. Keep in mind, even if the enemy forces take the city, they likely won't kill the civilians. They need them to work the land and pay taxes. Keep in mind the value of your own life, prince. You are worth more than a city that can be retaken. But Cain's protest was interrupted by a sharp strike to the back of his head. Stunned for a moment, he was struck again by an unseen force. Falling to the floor, the vial appeared out of the air, and a purplish contents quickly poured down the throat before he could recover. None present moved to assist him. As the prince's bodyguard Sibidia slowly faded into a visible distortion in the air, she spoke with her indistinct voice. Take us back to the capital, Magnus. Shun stood stoically facing west. I will not leave. My things to do here are not over. Right, Save it your way, Shin boy. Anyway, we've been talking long enough. The troops should be around any moment. Time for us to be the opposite of here. <laughs> Just a little ideal joke. The old man bent down unsteadily and grasped the unconscious form of Cain and a hazy form of Sibidia. With a light pop, the trio vanished and though they were never there. The great magician's vanishing act was perfectly timed. As the moment he disappeared, the enemy troops came into view, rounding the buildings. Only a few seconds later, the spell holding back the wave finally failed, and the clone shattering into triangular fragments and fading. Ghoul smiled, a parting gift from Magnus. He likely knew exactly where the enemy troops were and when they would arrive. He was a master of knowing more than he let on. Magnus loved to pretend to be tricked or not know something, only to turn the tables on the enemy when they thought they had an advantage. As the horde of worms rushed forward, their tangled bodies flowed outwards in every direction. To the elites of Gotheus, they were little concern. They might as well have not existed at all. The same could not be said for those invading troops. The troops, now clearly visible as soldiers of Fagia Republic, witnessed the state of the field. Their lines came to a halt. It seemed that they had been expecting to catch more of the city's defenders in a pincer, and were not expecting such a rapid and successful retreat. Ghoul had to admit, if it weren't for the grand spell from Magnus, a majority of the city's fighting force would still be in the middle of disengaging. The only result would have been the crushing defeat. With that one play, however, the situation had reversed. As expected of the use of such ideals as the opposite and the mirror. 
For all he claims of not caring about the city, Magnus had saved it. The enemy commander also saw the situation for what it was. After taking only a moment to scan the field, he yelled his orders out. All troops, hold! Defensive line! As expected of the militaristic Fagia Republic, the soldiers quickly and flawlessly followed the order. Within moments, they had formed into a neat phalanx across the road, each end against the building. Simultaneously, magic users at the back formed a barrier in front of the phalanx, preventing all but the most powerful of monsters from advancing. Those few that pushed through were destroyed by a coordinated attack, while the majority of beasts simply wandered off in different directions to lay waste to the town. The commander shouted over the noise of battle, this time towards the elite of Galthaeus, who now stood within a ring of monster corpses. The city of Galthaeus has the honor of being integrated into the Fagia Republic. If you surrender now, you will be given full citizenship and released after the transition is complete. What do you say? Ghoul chewed over the officer's offer. He was telling the truth. That was how the Republic operated. It was an unheard of for entire cities to surrender to an invading force from Fagia due to the reputation of fair treatment. By contrast, nations like Asang, which would kill all life in newly conquered territory, would inspire towns to fight desperately to the last man. The question then was what choice would be best to serve the people of Gotheus? Should he fight these soldiers while the dungeon wave monsters destroy the town, or should he simply allow Gotheus to transition to new leadership? and work together with them to arm quickly to clear the wave. If they surrendered to the Republic and the counterattack by Pankal was there but inevitable, and they would be much less lenient. The death toll was certain to be high with that choice. Complicating matters was the deaths of those Delvers and Gosman already killed in the attack, which weighed heavily on the leader's soul. The Church will follow the Association's lead on this matter, Leader Ghoul. The high priest elegantly deflected responsibility for the decision. I can't do this without you two. I'll follow your choice as well. Algar laid out the burden of a choice on his shoulders. With resignation in his voice, Leader Ghoul shouted over the combat, We surrender. Before he could finish, the enemy commander's head lifted his shoulders. Looking up to the side, mouth agape, he saw a samurai shin with a sword to his side. Chafing completed a cut. Cries of rage spread through the Republic's soldiers. Commanders were known to be very popular amongst their troops of Fagia. It was extremely unlikely now that they could accept surrender. The soldiers soon confirmed that suspicion as arrows and bolts of magic began to fly in ox towards Galthaeus' elites. Shen, what in the abyss? Algar shouted towards the black-armored youth as she weaved between the attacks of shooting arcs of lightning in return. Cut the head from the snake. Killing the enemy commander is a good tactic. I could not miss my chance. Through the slit of his visor, a look of joy could be seen in his eyes. Besides, there has been such death here today. I can't be defeated. That accursed ultimate is finally driven him insane. Somehow the high priest managed to maintain his perfect tall posture amongst the chaos. Fool, muttered Ghoul. Although the reprimanding him, relief was clear in their faces. In their hearts, none of them could forgive Fagia for what they had done. Surrendering was the wise thing to do, but fighting is what they desired. General, the first prince has escaped, and our countermeasures were unsuccessful. I suspected as much. It was worth a try. At least, um, if his father hadn't picked such a competent guards, we might have got him. Oh well... The demon rose his eyebrows in surprise as Shin used the ranged martial technique to kill the elected commander. Oh, they decided to fight. Interesting. Belfar could hardly hide his joy in his face. He would be able to slaughter freely this time. It was also so disappointing when they surrendered. He had even made sure to do multiple sneak attacks before making the offer to surrender so that they would be less inclined to agree. And it seemed to have paid off. Send the signal to the troops to ambush the retreating defenders. They are now enemy combatants. As if an afterthought, he added a message. Send scouts to check on Sithlar's mansion. If he fled like Magnus, we might be able to loot some valuables. In truth, Valafar simply wanted to antagonize Sithlar in the hopes that he would retaliate against Fagia. 
It was a delicate balancing act, accomplishing enough achievements to remain powerful and beloved in the Fagia Republic, while also setting them up for disaster at every opportunity. His fellow demon, Jabrax, had also requested specifically that he send a small amount of troops to harass the location. While the two demons had not shared the majority of the plans with each other, due to the demands of the demonic etiquette, she had implied the attacks would assist in some convoluted plot that she had devised. Since the mansion seemed to be the base of operations for a contractor, the demon could only speculate that the act would assist in driving the golem towards the desired action. And interested as Balafar was in his own endeavors, he couldn't wait to see what Jabrax had in store for the world. The demon rule of not sharing unnecessary information about plots allowed for surprise and joy when the plot you never even imagined comes to fruition. What that little golem of hers can do, Balafar wondered, when he was driven into a corner. End of chapter and that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. If you did, please consider supporting the author from the link down below. Otherwise, if you wish to support this channel, there are numerous ways to do so, like liking, subscribing, and possibly even becoming a patron. Otherwise, the easiest way would be to share. And until the next video, I hope that you all have a good one, and I'll see you then. Cheers.